Okay, so today we're going to talk about multiple sequence alignments. So this is chapter six in the book. So the goal here is to have an idea of how multiple sequence alignments works, particularly a little bit more about the Tassel W related programs, uh, and also know something about other programs and a bit like how they differ and so on. And then we also talk a bit about how multiple sequence alignments are used and uh, not so much about how they are surrounding using genomics readers. So why do you want to do an MSA? So the, the, the idea is first that you want to use data from more than one sequence at a time to understand something. So you can have an MSA to provide evolutionary information. So it's actually used for, if you want to calculate phylogeny, so how different genes are related to each other, or even how different species are related to each other, you need to have a multiple sequence alignment to, to calculate that. So basically you want to calculate the distances between each pair of genes, something like that. And that's something that we, you will cover in uh, the comparative genomics course later this year. It's uh, so not here today. But it's also useful for a lot of other downstream tasks. So one thing we looked at yesterday actually was when we, that you use multiple six alignments to create, create a PSSM, which then can be used for searching for more homologs. You can find use to find more distantly related proteins. Uh, another thing is that it's actually useful for structure prediction. Uh, so it's it's you, that that's something I will talk about later in the course. We use uh, what's called alpha form, and it's based on the idea that they have correlation between different points in the in the multiple six alignment. But it's also useful for function prediction. For instance, I remember the key thing is like if something is conserved, some position in the multiple six alignment is always conserved. Right? In comparison to everything else, that has a functional reason. This evolution has conserved for some reason, and that can give you clues about function of of mm. that residue. And that is an important rescue for them. So there's a lot of things that can be learned from a multiple six alignment. Uh, now, in principle, there are five or maybe even six different ways to calculate an MSA. You can actually do it using split waterman, my complicated. Uh, so you can do an exact pattern, you can compare all sequences against all sequences. The problem is that you actually have it all against all. Uh, and all combinations again, all combinations. So they're basically scales like two to the power n times l to the power n uh, sequences. So that is only possible for a very small number, maybe five or something like that. That's importance. So it's basically un unfeasible to do that. But otherwise, that's the optimal way to do it. You, so what's more common is that you use progressive alignments, methods. The most famous ones are cluster W, or now it's called cluster omega. And you basically start from all Paris alignments, which is just n square. Uh, and um, then you start aligning the most similar sequences, and then you add things up later. Uh, so in, with these methods, you're going to handle maybe thousands of sequences. And the only main disadvantage is actually it slightly depends on how, what you start with. So if you start with the, I mean, the most similar pairs, you start with, but if the things are almost the same similarity, the iteration start to, so if you start introducing a gap in one alignment, that's the right change. So to overcome that, there are methods like muscle or pay line that actually start with the same thing, but then it has an iteration process to, to make them MSA better. And there are also methods like MAFT, I think the problem comes to have iterative and then or trying to be consistent in the way they line things together. So they're basically trying to uh, find the, the breaks, the inconsistencies, and then sort of just like. And there was a method to use uh, structure, for instance, for doing this. I mean, actually, the model structure alignment, but that's not what we were talking about today. However, all these methods are sort of limited to like maybe a few hundred or thousand sequences. And of course, today, there are many protein families that have more than a thousand hits. So they're very big. And in these cases, it's very hard to find optimal alignment. And all these methods actually can understand and makes quite noisy alignments. However, uh, so that's why methods like Cyblast and other methods talk about X often start the much simpler method. They just start one sequence and then you just pile up all the other things of that and ignore any gaps in the starting sequence. So that of course makes the multiple sequence always be the same length. It starts with a queer sequence. And the good thing of course that that is scales just uh, linear with the database, so it, it, it's quite fast. And at the end, actually, you often get. MSAs that are even more useful than you get from other methods because the other ones also have a tendency to do too many gaps at the right. 
it's not really an MSA method because it doesn't, it ignores gaps in one sequence. That's sort of way basically. So, yeah, so as I said, the reason is, of course, one point is that nowadays the databases are bigger and bigger. If you don't know more about the families, so this is PFAM coverage, you see that it basically always causes the same fraction of the rest of the proteins in, in, in PFAM. But this sequence database is getting bigger and bigger. So, that means that for each family you have, you have more hits. So, even like in this five years here of this course, it basically doubled or almost quadrupled. And so, of course, in previous years, better genomic sequences, you have hundreds or even millions of sequences to a single, single family. And that is just hard to handle. And yeah, maybe it doesn't add so much value either. Okay, so the idea of progressive alignment here is that I can exemplify here is that you start with this set of sequences. So in this case, it's five globins from beta, myoglobin, neuroglobin, soya bean, and rice. And then you do a pairwise alignment and you can get the distance, basically just the number of mutations, but the distance. And in this case, you find, aha, uh -huh, the closest pair here is rice and soya bean. So you do rice, they have the score, which is 43, which is the highest score. So you start aligning rice and soya bean. And then you look at how the next highest pair is beta globin and myoglobin. So you have beta globin and myoglobin, you have a score of 25, so you take that one. And then you basically do an alignment of this uh, neuroglobin to one of these, and then you add, uh, add all together. You basically just progressively align more and more sequences. So, uh, yeah, so this is like, uh, so to do this okay, efficiently, class the W, you use like this inversion, you use another type of alignments, but you start with the same thing. So, in this case here, you have a high score between human and pan, as you can see. The human has the highest, has a score of 100. So, you start aligning these two, so that's a pair of sequence alignment, and you want all the other pairs. And then you do neighbor joining. Neighbor joining is a polarity method that brings the nearest neighbors to each other. And you can calculate this three here. So you see a human pan, and then I want to add the dog, the candidate familiaris. So you see this is 89 to the uh, score of that's a pan, and to human, it has a score of 89. So, but you align it not to one of the sequences, you align it to the profile basically made of these two sequences. And then you add the mouse and the uh, uh, chicken to this later. So, and at the end, you end up with a global alignment. Nowadays, cluster W is a bit slow and it doesn't handle very well. So people use a different version called cluster omega, which is continuous, which start doing things like the pairs line is not all like once all space. What might just take long? You use you basically use a K tuple uh, yeah. looking at words that blast hits space to each other. Uh, and then you do clustering of these using what's called the embed method, and then you're using uh, uh, using K means clustering. And then you divide in several guides, you, you bring out, and then you, then you uh, construct another guide against, and then you do progress alignment using HSLI, which is faster than you had the early methods. So basically, it's the same idea, but you just use tweaks for handling more sequences. So just the Omega can handle maybe 100,000 sequences quite accurately. Mapped, as I said, is an example here from the book that. Does iterative starts. So it does the same thing basically as Omega. It doesn't uh, it start with initial alignments and they start this, and then they group them together, and then it sort of refine things. The, so it's like, all right, let's split it here and move, move change the alignment, divide the sub alignment, and you, you need a new alignment that one, and you check if the alignment is better, and if it's improved, you improve. So you keep on iterating the alignment to be better and better. So start from your initial cluster W alignment, like that. So you can, you can, in this case, you can see you can shift a little bit. But so, so that can sort of deal with maybe gaps, I think, that in a better way. So here's just an example of globins aligned to each other from cluster W. And you see here a few things. You see that there are three residues, the F in position of W45, and the two histories are conserved in all five sequences. Then they are important for the function of globins. You can see there are lots of gaps here in all sequences except the rice, the rice is longer, so a, has a region here that is actually part of helix as long because we have this helix in this case. And you see these gaps here at the end, and the terminal part of this helix in the other sequences. But you see, so the beta and the myoglobin are identical in this region, and then they have seven gaps, while the neuroglobin has another three as you use the soya bean two and the rice, uh, another five or something. 
So this looks like it probably quite good alignment that you know, at least in, in these positions are quite conserved. But you see that there's shifts here in the secondary structure that's maybe not perfect in that, but it looks quite good. And if you compare it to other methods, you can see, for instance, this is first one is muffed. That basically does you see the history in here is also conserved, but it's sort of and has a few more sequences. And you can see that it sort of like moves these gaps around a little bit. So it tries to keep them here uh, and move them around a bit. So this is a soya bean that we had in the earlier one. You see, had the four gaps in one place. Now you split that gap. Oh, sorry. You split this gap into one place and three others. So you sort of move the one or two and move the gap to another place. The rise is still compared to the rise. And then the gap of this uh, other ones also slightly shifts. So they have two gaps instead. And muscle, another of these methods sort of also does an iterative refinement, and it sort of has a problem here. In this case, the histidine, I mean, it likes to get rid of gaps, but then it's concerned, histidine is not concerned with the position of motion. There's a shift there. So to avoid some gaps, it actually moves this concerned histidine to another place, which functionally probably doesn't make sense. Uh, and uh, probe con seems to fix that again, and here it's hard to see. But here's another problem with the uh, tea coffee, which is structural alignment version. That's sort of that aligns PDB files is that, and it sort of works fine, but it also misses in one of these proteins the position of the last day. Thing. So this is like clear case instead of, well, it's not obvious. If you want to know this history problem, if you use muscle, for instance, you will not detect it. Or at least you will not be certain about it. So clearly, the important is that uh, uh, the alignment method works. It might matter what you do, what you, depends on what you get. Okay, so now the authors, I guess you heard about PFAM already in, in, in this in database. So key, PFAM is a database of protein families, protein domain families, and has a few key concepts that are important to know. So one key, key concept is that the seed alignment is actually, I mean, for each family, domain family, it has a seed alignment. So it's a manually curated alignment that it sort of contains all the important information. It's for these options, it's short, short and down, so you take away variable readers and answer it, but it sort of contains the most important features for detecting things. So you have a seed alignment that you then can make a PSM of or a model model of, and you use that for searching the data basically the full alignment. So in this case, you have a seed alignment of 73 residues uh, for this Google family, and you have the full alignment contains 6,000 residues, 6,000 proteins. So, so this is the seed alignment. So you can see here it actually has a secondary structure element, but if you have it has some conserved positions in some places that it has in this day is all conserved. And uh, here there are some conserved positions that are important. Uh, you will in the lab look at a program called Jalview, which is one good tool for alignment aligning multiple six alignments and for visualizing them. Uh, so you will actually do some of the alignments using these tools. So actually all these tools we talked about here, I think, should be able, able to run from the algorithm. It can be run both from the website and as a download, but the download has some more functions than the website, so it's better to run that if you can. Uh, most of the things you can also run through a tool called HS Suite. And there you can actually run most of these alignments, those, but uh, not all, I think, but you can run CastW or anything like that. Like that. So, I would recommend you to look at the Yalview tutorial, which is down there. And that's it. Thank you very much.